Hi, Kathy. Welcome to Ghost Stories by the Fire. Hello, Sasha. I'm just going to go ahead and start with this question. Did you, by chance, grow up in a house that believed in ghosts or had a history of ghost storytelling? I have to say no. You, I, My parents were very sort of pragmatic scientists. So in, not that science and, you know, ghosts and things don't overlap at times in general no it wasn't like we, it, it wasn't a lot of ghost stories except amongst friends you know when you like get together for sleepovers or go camping or something like that then you start telling all the ghost stories did you have any friends who crazy things happened when you were together i i was having a sleepover and we kind of spent the the night like watching scary movies. And then we went up to my bedroom. I was very young. I was like seven or something. And we shared a bed and we started telling ghost stories. And then as I was going off to sleep, it was like I felt sort of this presence, but it was very warm. And I looked up to the, you know, the corner of my bedroom at the ceiling and I saw the image of my grandfather. And he was just sort of, I remember the smile on his face and it was just, you're going to be great. You're going to be fine. I miss you. I love you. That kind of a thing. And I, I sort of shook, I shook my friend and say, look at my granddad. He's here. Do you see him? She's like, no. And I'm like, no, see, he's up there. And I was so excited about it. I mean, it wasn't a negative thing at all, except that she was like totally freaked out. <laughs> and because it was so convincing, you know, uh, I think uh, then she just, she called her mom and just went home because that was too much for her. <laughs> but for me, it was the most beautiful thing. So I had kind of experiences on both sides. So that's, that's a very interesting story. So you could see him, but your friend mm. couldn't see him. Is that? No, I, I really had a, a really specific vision of him wow. and she she saw nothing she just saw the darkness so that's why it freaked her out but for me it was like beautiful because i missed him so much and and he hadn't been gone very long and he was such a huge influence in my life up to that point and um so it was a beautiful thing for me but but just the idea of a, a ghost in my room that she really <laughs> didn't know and i'm describing in detail she was like yeah this is creepy What's interesting about that is so many cultures around the world um, have that like 30 or 60 days after somebody passes over. A lot of cultures believe they're still there. They're still in the house um, that that it, it that it's not quite so quick that spirits don't pass over or aren't kind of gone. Um, yeah, that that quickly. And so it sounds to me like your grandfather certainly was there within a month or two after his passing? Yeah, something like that. But when you think about it, I mean, they really feel like they're still there. You have to, I feel like after somebody has passed away, I feel like you have to remind yourself that they're gone. It feels like they're still in the, you feel their presence still. It feels like they're in the other room or something. I mean, I remember uh, going to my parents' place they, um, I, my mother had passed away, but my dad hadn't yet. By going there, I stayed there by myself and I absolutely felt them, smelled them, you know, felt their presence in their home while I was there by myself for sure. And I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to be there just by myself to like absorb them because the next time I went, we had sold the property and it just, they were gone. It was, and, and actually the property, their house was sold with all their furniture and everything. So, so much of their stuff was still there, but they weren't, they were gone. It was a, it was a shell. Isn't that so interesting? My husband had just lost an aunt who was terribly sick for years with, uh, with Lou Gehrig's disease. And it was a very funny thing. Like her night nurses 
would say, oh, Sally's talking, you know, she's talking to her family, like they're in the corner, like, oh, like it's, it's time, it's time, the time is coming. Um, and it didn't come that quickly. She was, she was quite ill and deteriorating at home for a very long time. Um, and the first thing my husband did the night she passed when he went, he was like, oh, she's so gone. Like the next day in the apartment, like you can, to your point, like, she just vanished instantly. I th and then I think so much a part of that was being sick and being in a, a body that was deteriorated, um, not being able to move around your apartment, touch your things, do your things, all of that interesting um, residual energy that, that you can feel that's left behind. So speaking of ghost stories, obviously later in your life, you would grow up become a huge television and movie star <laughs> and and i know <laughs> and, and 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 certainly you're you're very well known for night of the comet which is a post-apocalyptic zombie amazing movie have you made any did you make any ghost story um did you do any ghost story or or horror film and television I did a couple of Outer Limits and a couple of Twilight Zones years and years ago. But um, so the, so there's always kind of a spooky element to those. I found with like the Outer Limits, especially, they were very sort of um, futuristic kind of stories, stories that kind of took this look into the future and had this kind of scary bent to them. Um, like one was called Unnatural Selection, where it's in the future and you can choose if you're if you're wanting to have a baby, you can choose at sort of the DNA of your baby. Um, so you go through this process where they where, where they check like your DNA and your husband's DNA, and they'll tell you what your baby's going to be like. And in this particular case, um, it showed that. Our baby was going to be kind of a loser, not very bright, and physically kind of ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided to go to this place and get this injection um, when I was pregnant that would create this, like, theoretically supernatural human being. Well, as it turns out in the story, our neighbors had done the same thing. And for years, they'd, they, oh, it was kind of a creepy household. They would never let anybody into the home because unbeknownst to anyone, they were kind of hiding their child. They had gotten the same um, injection and the child turned out to be completely just crazy, creepy, deformed, violent, every possible thing you could possibly think of. And but you'd hear like these wails and screams and things from the house, but like what, what what could that be, you know? And um after I get this procedure, I realized that um that that is what had happened to the they probably told some story about having a miscarriage or something, but what had actually happened with the baby. And the kid was like twelve years old by now and, and we're sitting there pregnant with having had the procedure going. Uh, oh no. <laughs> it was very, very creepy because you hear these stories about, you know, uh, sort of uh, mixing up DNA to create the perfect little baby. And that's what the story was about. And the other one was about um, in the future where uh, sort of the help, or you can hire a robot to kind of help around the house. But what happens? is the robot, robot starts completely taking over and calling on all your sort of um, faults, like, as it turns out, I'm a total, I'm a mother of two, and Tom Ar Arnold plays my husband, and we're, our relationship is not good, and I'm a total alcoholic. <laughs> and, and the, um, the uh, robot kind of calls me out on it and sort of blackmails me with this information. So... It's like AI, you know, taking over. It's sort of a, an old sort of version of what we're starting to see now. AI so scares me. But yeah, those were really, really sort of creepy, creepy stories.
So you bring up a really, really interesting point, which it always, it seems to me that artists and writers, filmmakers, um, uh, the people who create stories, right, um, um, for, for society at large are always seem to be picking up on things before they actually manifest in real life. So with both of those cases, both with the DNA and um, and also with the AI and all of the horrifying consequences, that's exactly what, what we're all kind of grappling with right now. And it is, it's kind of terrifying, this idea that you could upload consciousness, that perhaps, that perhaps even ghost stories, right? The idea that Maybe someday we'll never die, that, that our consciousness can be uploaded, that avatars of us will be around haunting our children. Oh, my God. No kidding. I, that'd be absolute, I could totally see that. I mean, the ghost stories can really manifest themselves in AI. I, ghosts can manifest themselves in, in AI. And, and, um, and then, you know, it's not just a story anymore, right? It's reality. And that that's a very interesting point because who knows if they would manifest themselves in a positive way or a negative way. Exactly. And definitely, yeah, imp- uh, penetrate like people's homes and their lives in really creepy, strange ways. And 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 we are, and because, and it's a funny thing because even technology, uh, um, like the big technology, like the way our phones are listening or the Alexa devices are listening in and, and the way that we can all... That in and of itself, it it feels very unnerving. It is if you think too much about it. It cracks me up when people, I mean, I don't know, but, you know, with the whole COVID thing and getting a shot for uh, for COVID and they would say, well, they're implanting blah, blah into your blood so they can follow you, whoever they are and why they would want to do that in the first place. But the question is, do you have a cell phone? Do you have the internet? I mean, there's, it's not just coincidence that you look up, you know, a wool sweater or something. And then for the next month, you get ads constantly for wool sweaters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's done. But we're just sort of naive about it. We love to make up, you know, I don't know, reasons to whatever. But, but it's, but, it's- um, but it's a funny thing because I had a guest on not too long ago who was talking about he was he was saying I don't believe in in ghosts and I'll tell you why I don't want to think that my dead relatives are watching me naked and watching me see the <laughs> <laughs> seeing what I'm doing yeah, naked watching me naked <laughs> because they've probably never seen a naked body before but that <laughs> as, that aside yeah that would be kind of creepy i never thought of that i have to say it's, it's kind but, of creepy yeah. but but if you think about the fact that if you log on to anything pornographic online you're probably being tracked right like i i mean I know. it's That's literally the reason well not that i'm that interested in pornography <laughs> but it's literally a a big reason I would never go on to a pornography site, even if I was just like, what is that all about anyway? It'd be like, because uh, somebody, it, it would be there forever and ever that I'd done that. And it's so creepy. <laughs> well, you're good. I don't let that stop me. I still log on. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so you did an Alfred Hitchcock Presents, didn't you? I did. I did. The new Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And, you know, they're, Alfred Hitchcock generally with it are these, of course, the old, or, or psychological dramas, basically. And I play this architect who is overworked and I'm struggling with this project that I've got to get done and I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating. And I have this little sister who is an actress and she's taking acting lessons. And um, she shows up in the, we, we live together in this apartment. She shows up in this apartment with an acting partner and they do this scene um, where the acting partner dies or something horrible happens, but it's so convincing. I believe her. And then it's, so this, it's a horrible thing. I'm, I'm exhausted and she's doing this thing and this guy dies in our apartment and um, I believe her and it creates all this stress. And then the guy gets up and she goes, it was an acting partner. Did you believe it? And I'm like, I can't believe you're doing this to me. So this happens a couple more times until the 
the end, I guess the third act, she's, she, uh, I, I don't know if I should give it all away, but she, she says that somebody is following her and she's really, really scared. And by, by this time I'm like, I can't deal with you right now. Leave me alone. This is not gonna, you know, you're not gonna fool me this time. Take your acting classes, just leave me alone. I've got this huge project to work on. And all of a sudden, this guy breaks into the apartment with a gun and he's got a mask on and he grabs the girl and he's threatening her, whatever. And I still don't believe her. So I'm like, he pulls the gun and I grab the gun out of his hands, <laughs> which is so funny that, you know, I just don't believe it. I think it's a fake thing. And she's like, oh, what are you doing? Don't, you know, be careful with the gun. Gun. And um, I said, I know that this is fake. And I hold it up to my head. Watch. And that's when it ends. Oh! I know. So like, I know. So it's like a cry wolf kind of a, a theme, you know. And then um, that's when it stops. So it's it's pretty darn creepy. But so much fun. Uh, it's so, so much fun. I just watched. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, so the little sister is literally punking you through the whole episode. Punking me through the whole episode until the very end. And when she's telling the truth and it's like this life-threatening situation, I don't believe her. Because why would I believe her now? She's been lying the whole time or acting. <laughs> so, and again, <laughs> so that's so much fun. Those You don't see those kind of shows anymore. I mean, The Outer Limits, uh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock presents, well, you don't see TV anymore. There, There's not TV in the way there was. No, I mean, I feel like, I feel like Black Mirror is an example, is kind of close to a modern day yeah. of that. And it's certainly like, it's certainly talking about all of the, all of the creepy stuff that, it's so funny that it just, we go back to technology as being the creepy thing, really more the, the ghosts and the machines that we're all using that we're kind of slave yeah. to. Right now, I know because it's it's accelerating at such a pace that it it it's out of I I believe it's already out of control, and now you know we started talking about AI like like regularly, maybe a year ago, and now um, it's it's like it's everywhere and and you hear ads uh, talking about how ai will help you improve your business and it's everywhere and it's just accelerating 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 and it just doesn't feel like anybody really has control over it so it's a little it's scary it's i find it scary i, I saw a strange thing um on on the new york times last night that you can now have now because it is because we're recording this in the in december it's the christmas season the holiday season you can now listen to jimmy stewart tell you christmas stories except it's not really jimmy stewart it's his voice cropped together through ai kind of like you know looking at um at carrie fisher you know the pieces of her in the star wars movies so what do you what do you think um as as an actor uh as someone whose image um is is really out there what what do you do you think about that and what scares you about that, if anything? Well, I mean, it, it's very scary. I mean, we're at a real uh, turning point here in for, especially for performers of all kinds from, you know, narrators to who make their living at narrating and now they're not necessary. I mean, my, it's so funny you say that because my husband was saying, I just saw that uh, I fa found this thing about Jimmy Stewart reading stories that are supposed to help put you to sleep. And it's not Jimmy Stewart, it's AI. And I was like, oh. I mean, he's not even around to defend himself. I mean, you know, in our union, Actors Union, we've been trying to deal with it on some level. Again, it's accelerating so fast and it, it's... it. I, it, it, it's almost impossible, I would think, ultimately to trace if somebody's used, like extras even, you know, they've been using CGI extras for a long time and CGI sets and things like that. 
Um, but the, the people make a living at this and they're just going to be eliminated. Um, comedians have really been very, very nervous. Uh, script writers, you know, I mean, you can, you can put in, you know, a, a so-and-so style murder mystery um, feature film. It's AI and like in 10 minutes, you've got a script as opposed to the months and months and, you know, that it takes to write a script and then you write it over again and over again and over again. The only solace I have is that it just might not seem so human. But again, then you see, um, I mean, I think a lot of us have seen this, some Tom Cruise thing where he's AI. Some guy is acting as Tom Cruise. He's got a similar body and they stick his face on there and, and his voice. What, what makes me nervous about this stuff, and as a, as a tarot author, as a tarot deck creator, something that, that I've seen happen profusely is illegally copied and distributed tarot decks, right? Um, and these are going into entire foreign markets. Like, it's one thing, like, when we're just talking about, like, the internet that we're all looking at, right? But when you're looking at other parts of the world where there's no way to legislate late or protect Tom Cruise, if his like doppelganger AI is being used for something, like what are the legal restraints with that? Like I can't stop, people are making thousands of dollars off of my tarot decks, my public, where all our hands are tied, you know? And that's, that's not even AI generated. That's just the ability to copy and distribute and put up a store online and pretend you're whoever you, it's just wild. I don't know. Yeah, it's crazy. And then of course it gets into the whole political thing where the fake news and, and they, they show, there was something on the news uh, where there was like an, a, a fake AI explosion at the Pentagon. And the, they said that the, uh, like the Dow Jones dropped like 17,000% or something when that was like, or points percent, whatever it is. I don't know a lot about that stuff, but um it, it it's really consequential and very very easy to do. Like politicians, you know, giving speeches and it's not really them. And then of course, you know, the whole it's 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 creepy. It's getting into dangerous aspects of our lives for sure. But what I think is fascinating about this is it does mm -hmm. tie back to ghost stories because. What's the first thing, right, that anybody will ask you or what's the first thing you even try and differentiate for yourself? Say it's the middle of the night and you wake up and you think you see someone, say, standing at the foot of your bed. And then you look back and they're gone. And you say, did, did I really see that? Was that real? Right? And, and it's almost as if we have to now ask the same. And, I, and I'm guilty of it. I mean, I just posted on my story, this ridiculous filter that made me look like a supermodel. And I was like having fun with it, right? And then people were responding to it as if it was real. And I had to write back and say, it's a filter, like, thank you. But that's really not yeah, what yeah, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. at all. So it's almost, it, so it's interesting that, that now we're having to ask ourselves the same questions that we would ask when we think maybe we've had a ghostly experience, did I see something that was real or, or was it my imagination or was it fake or was it, I don't know, was it a trick, you know? And yeah, I mean, I, I think that as AI develops, they will, I mean, that sort of a, a thing, that sort of a vision or image will be more and more real. And again, more and more out of our hands, I think, you know, we could, in our imaginations are, are so complex that we can either create or, you know, manifest or something, lots and lots of different things. And then you can sort of debate whether it's real or whether it's not real. But I, th I feel like at a certain point, like the point you brought up earlier, you know, relatives who have died, I, I, it doesn't seem crazy to me at all that instead of having to look at a photo album, you can just uh, bring up an AI image of the person and hold a conversation with them, you know? I can see that 100%. Um, and that's maybe the me most benevolent way of looking at the whole AI thing. But, but 
who knows where that could go. I mean, it could then maybe be able to turn itself on at the, at the most unexpected times or something like that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, it's interesting concept and interesting thing to think about, but also going back to, you know, so many shows that have sort of sci-fi, you know, shows that have kind of talked about what might happen in the future, even when sci-fi first existed, um, they were, they were trying to predict the future and it's kind of incredible how much sci-fi has come true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. So I have to ask you, when you are playing something that is spooky or when you're even playing something that's life and death or, or say, I don't know, you're wired up with a bunch of squibs and have to fake your own death or, I don't know, murder someone, do you feel like you take that work home with you? Is is there a gray area where the characters that you're playing begin to invade your real life and have friends ever and family and loved ones ever commented on it for you about <laughs> you? Well, certainly I think so. I do think so. Certainly when I'm preparing for roles, I mean, my husband will say, well, she's on planet Thespos, <laughs> like Thespian, yeah, Thespos, um, because you really do have to explore this character that's not necessarily who you are every day. I think that every character, well, that I portray certainly has a lot of me in it, but you explore, explore elements of yourself that you might not normally share in the real world, which is what's so cool about acting. If you're willing to go there, because you can go to some pretty crazy places, but it's interesting to see it kind of explore those little, you lift up those little rocks that you keep firmly planted on the ground to um, help with the different characters that you play. You know, I mean, I think all of us have so many dimensions that we don't explore and acting kind of gives you the opportunity to do that but mostly we sort of keep them all kind of pushed down and um we kind of carry on in a civilized sort of way that's acceptable to um most people but there's of course there's exceptions to that rule as well um people that don't really have the capability of controlling that side of them or whatever that's when it gets kind of spooky for us, maybe not for them, but for the, we're so generic as a, as a, as, as a, as human beings, you know, we accept certain things. We don't accept other things and people that sort of veer slightly from that, it becomes creepy or unacceptable. And that's, a, that's a bit sad too. Um, I think they're trying, I think in general, we're trying to, as human beings, trying to open up the idea that it's okay to be a little strange, like not completely the norm. And I, I feel like also we could get so much from that if we're, you know, we're so wound up and tightly bound, you know, in what we expect and what we think we should do. Because I feel like you get outside those, those walls or that box, you can learn so much. Which, in fact, I, I feel like people who do sort of have this um, relationship or whatever with ghosts or something that isn't the norm is like, we can all learn so much from that. As you're talking, I, I have to ask what, um, and I always say, every time I go away to make a horror movie, I find like it's always cathartic for some reason in my low budget movies, I'm always killing men. And so I come home, <laughs> my husband completely cleansed. I'm like, Oh, um, what, what it's, not, it's a good thing you can do all that in your movies. <laughs> Get that out of your system. That's a good thing. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a really good thing. What in, in in and I know that you have you've played so many characters, but what has been the most kind of out of bounds and exhilarating role that you've ever played that really pushed you to your limits? Oh, there's so many elements that can go into that 
Um, I think one of the most challenging uh, roles I played was um, it was I was supposed to be a person that actually had existed. It was a it was a miniseries called um, Passion in Paradise with Armand Asante. And um, I played a character, it, it was during the Second World War, but it also involved British royalty and smuggling gold into the Bahamas. There's all sorts of this, all sorts of um, political and just dark stuff going on. But I played this character who, uh, whose father is brutally murdered and, um, my lover is blamed for it. So it was extremely emotional. She was a real human being. She had been dead a, a long time. Books had been written about this whole situation. Um, so that was like just honoring that human being and that whole situation, you know, sort of trying to portray a character in an era that you weren't even born yet in. So. Um, that was tough. Um, and uh, you know, it was, it was just, it was just very, very challenging physically, mentally, emotionally, everything. Um, um, I, what I really have a lot of fun playing is like the alcoholic middle-aged woman who's sort of pissed off at her life. <laughs> I love doing that. I find that very cathartic. <laughs> Like you're killing men, I'm just getting drunk. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a Tuesday night. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Exactly. That's Two glasses of Chardonnay, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so have you ever? Have you ever um, in your real life, not in your creative, not in your professional life, but in your real life, have you ever made contact or had any sort of uh, an experience? with something that seemed to come from the other side? When I was older, I was first in California and I was in, you know, one of my first apartments and I was so happy being there. I love, I, I really love sort of solitude. I love living by myself. Um, I really, because I just have, feel a lot of freedom with that. I, I feel like I can do whatever I want. I had a cat, which was great, buckwheat my cat. Um, and I just love this little home, this little um, apartment. It was a, it was an older apartment building, um, two stories, and there was maybe, I want to say like six units. So I knew all my neighbors, and, and it was very um, a friendly place. I loved it. I, I, I loved every minute of it. it. It was in Westwood, and at that time, it was the eighties. Um, that particular, it was sort of uh, south of Westwood Village, just a little bit north of Santa Monica Boulevard, and it was kind of an iffy area at that time, but it didn't really bother me. I didn't care, but I would put things like plants on my, I was on the first floor, and like I said, it was only two floors, I, and I put this big plant on my doorstep, and I'd wake up the next day, and it would be gone. <laughs> I'm like, oh. That's not a good sign. <laughs> um, anyway, one night I was crawling in my bed with buckwheat, my cat, and, and she and I used to have this game where uh, I, I, I'd climb into bed and pull the sheets up and she'd be at like the head of the bed and I would, um, with my hand under the sheets, I'd come up and I'd grab her front pull, par, <laughs> paws and pull her under the sheets. And that sounds horrible. She loved it. She'd come go into the thing and she'd blah, 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 and, we'd and we'd just sort of wrestle under the sheets and then she'd crawl back out and she'd wait for it to happen again. It was so much fun. Every night we used to do that. Every night. So anyway, we went through our usual ritual and I sort of finished that, turned the light out, sort of settled in to go to sleep, closed my eyes and I kind of looked up and I looked at my bedroom door and normally I just close my bedroom door. I mean, I'm the only person there, but I don't, I don't know why. And I looked up and it was ajar a little bit. And I guess some of the light off the street was sort of shining on the other room. So I could see, you know, the crack of the door. And I thought, oh, 
I get up and close that door, shouldn't I? I don't know. I just have to roll over again. And then I, I don't know. I have to have things just so when I go to bed sometimes. So I thought, oh, I uh, looked at it again. And literally, I don't know how to do this, but I, I saw these fingers come around the edge of the door. These black, pointy nailed fingers came around the edge of the door and I was just like, I didn't, I, I was paralyzed. I was just looking at these fingers. And I just, I was paralyzed. I was so scared. And I was just like, I closed my eyes and I was like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What can I do? I don't have any, I didn't have any weapons. I had nothing around me. I was just like, I don't know what to do. I opened my eyes again. And it was gone. And so I, I got up, very quietly to the door, put it up. And there was nobody there. But I was like, I closed the door. I locked it. I didn't go out into the room and I crawled back into bed and I don't think I slept that night, but I have no idea what that was to this day. And every time I think of it, I just go, I don't know what that was, but I'm okay. And I survived and everything was like, never happened again, but I'm telling you, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm saying earlier that I come from a sort of a pragmatic family. They don't really tell ghost stories. They don't, everything is pretty much black and white and very scientific and all that other stuff, which is great. And I'd never had that kind of experience before that scared me so much. Anyway, no idea what that was. That is horrifying. <laughs> horrifying. <laughs> And I love that you did probably what I would do too, which was like stay in the room. Like I would not go investigate. No oh way. God, there was no way I was gonna go out of that room. And I of course I was like listening for footsteps or something, but I didn't hear anything. The next day I sort of came out and there was no sign that I I don't know what it was, Sasha. Man. <laughs> And like I said, it was an older building. It was probably built in like the 20s or 30s, maybe. It was that kind of era. Um, maybe 40s, but maybe it was somebody coming back just to check in. I love the pointed, it sounds like very, like it sounds like a Lady Gaga ghost. Like very like, um, um, uh, 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 I don't know, like American Horror Story with the pointy nails. But it was like... They, I mean, I can just assume that it was nail. They were very black, you know? It was like I couldn't see nails per se, but it was just very dark and just there. Like glow. Oh, it's very Ooh, cool. that's so, so creepy. Something that I discovered, there's a big difference between talking, like doing ghost stories with a crowd and just talking one-on-one. -on -one. And something yeah. that you just reminded me of again is the little bit of kind of cleansing and like safe boundaries that that and that are important to erect when we're telling stories like ghost stories like that's really scary. <laughs> I know. It's amazing. So I'm going to I'm dying to ask you and this is something that I ask every guest who who comes on. But with no right or wrongs, with no definitives because we're talking about um we're talking about, uh, so I'm looking out the window. It's just started snowing, big, fat, beautiful snowflakes. <laughs> I have to kind of pretty magical. But what is your hunch based on, based on your life experience, your creative experience, um, your imaginative experience? What is your hunch on where we were before we were born? And what do you think? What do you think might happen for us when we pass back over? Pass back over. Um, I have, first of all, I believe that when we pass over, our, our 
afterlife has everything to do with how we let our lives, our life life, <laughs> this life now, whether there was me before now or not, I, I feel like, or if there's something after, I feel like it all has to do with how we let our lives in this moment, in this life, in this existence, which of course is like that. It's a second in time in the big picture. But to me, it's so important, not only for your own health and well being, but for everyone around you to live your life in a way that is is benevolent, is positive, is is observant, is 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 a, is a way of educating people, is or or sharing experience that passing you know passing it forward, um, all those kind of things. I mean, obviously everybody has bad days, negative days. We can't help it. We get mad. We, we lash out and it's a part of human nature, but the big picture is living day to day. First of all, I believe in living in the moment. <laughs> People ask me, what'd you do yesterday? I'm like, I have no idea, <laughs> but living in the moment and making the most of every moment. And when you pass, I believe that is the spirit that exists um, in the universe, to the people that knew you, to the people that were close to you. Um, and that, you know, it, it, I mean, I, I, there are so many people in the world, it's always surprising to me, who are just really negative or, or critical or they, they feel like they're above everyone else or yeah, I, I really, I mean, allowed people to influence me and made me feel less than because that's how they behave. They are, and I, you know, I also believe it's, it's rooted in a deep insecurity on their part, but, um, but it still has a never negative impact on people um, who, who are exposed to that, you know, and why would you expose somebody to that? So there's so many people, and it always surprises me, and I, and I, I really have never been able to figure out why they would uh, uh, allow, um, give that much space to something that doesn't, it, that doesn't benefit anybody, including themselves, uh, ultimately. Maybe in a short term it might somehow, but... Um, so that's sort of, I feel, the, the spirituality of the human being that existed during their short moment on earth is what exists after they've left this, whatever this is. Um, yeah. And, and do, were you asking about before? Yeah. I also, I also believe, I, yeah, I also believe, by the way, that, that we uh, uh, just physically as carbon-based animals contribute to the health of the earth after we, we pass, mm -hmm. you know, physically becoming a part of the earth again, I feel like is the greatest gift, you know, we're trying as hard as we can to destroy that, but <laughs> I feel like this whole concept of, you know, being being part of the roots of a new tree or something like that. I love that concept, being a part of rejuvenating nature in any way that you possibly can. Because we're all, we're not only are, are human beings a part of each other, but we're also a part of the earth that we are, we're part of the stars. We're made up of all the same sort of stuff. We're made of dinosaur and star bits. Like, yes, exa I, exactly. Again. We're all carbon based and everything in the universe is carbon based. And so people forget that. And I, I love that concept. We're just a different form of, ca of carbon based existence, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. 
Well, that's, that's fabulous. Great. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Catherine Mary Stewart, thank you so much for coming on yeah. Ghost Stories by the Fire. Um, My and pleasure, I'd Sasha Graham. I'd love to have you on again in the future if you'd be willing. Oh, yes, I'd love to, for sure. Yes, for sure. We could go on and on forever on this, couldn't we? <laughs> Thank and we, and you. we could over a nice glass of Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> well, let's say that we will. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for being part of Ghost Stories by the Fire. Do you have a spooky story, near-death experience, or supernatural happening you'd like to share? I'd love to hear it. Submit your story to sashagram.com with Ghost Stories by the Fire in the subject line. You might just wind up on this podcast. And if you want to support it and keep the ghost stories coming, head on over to sashagram.com to check out my books and tarot decks, which are available for purchase at your favorite bookseller. The Ghost Stories by the Fire theme song is titled Lovely from the original motion picture score of The Deeper You Dig, a film about the lengths a mother will go to to find her daughter's killer. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, I'm saving you a seat at the fire.